Hey everyone, uh, Dr. Louie and Dr. Namani back here with the Athletes Fund again. Thanks for joining us. And we've got a really cool guest with us today, actually. This is Dr. Jennifer Bauer, who is the chief of spine at Seattle Children's Hospital in, well, Seattle, Washington. Thanks so much for having me, guys. Really excited. Dr. Bauer, it's really great to have you here today. And, you know, um, uh, recently we spoke with Dr. Brandon Carlson at the University of Kansas uh, about uh, some initial thoughts regarding adolescent idiopathic scoliosis. And we thought today it'd be really nice to have a, have a true expert who's really established herself as a leader in the field of treating pediatric patients with scoliosis to hear about the unique issues they deal with in terms of how they deal with uh, non-operative scoliosis and, and how it affects their ability to return to sport as well as those patients who are looking towards a possible surgery. Absolutely. Uh, you know, I think whenever we think about pediatrics, our goal is to get children and teenagers back to what they love doing. And so in the adolescent population, oftentimes it's getting them back to their sports. So whatever we do uh, for a treatment, we want to make sure that it's not going to prevent them from doing what they want to do and what they love doing. So when you think about scoliosis, as you can probably refer back to on the earlier coverage of, of uh, AIS here, adolescent idiopathic scoliosis, um, First, we just have uh, teenagers who maybe have a smaller curve and don't need a brace or uh, any surgery at all. And for those athletes, we just want them to continue living their lives. Just having this curve won't necessarily mean that they have back pain and it um, shouldn't, shouldn't hurt their athletic ability or their ability to participate in any sports at all. Uh, so you, even, don't limit, you, don't limit those, you don't limit those patients at all. You just say, hey, go at it. Yeah, you've got a curve, but we'll keep an eye on it. Sort of exactly. We say, right we up. know we can see it in the x-rays, go live your life, come back and we'll check it again. Um, even Usain Bolt has a little bit of scoliosis actually. So uh, he's a pretty fast guy. Um, and so then if we go to the next step, curves that get a little bit bigger, those are the curves that we start to talk about doing, um, placing into a brace to try to keep the curves smaller while that teenager is uh, growing or towards when they're done growing. Same thing though, for these patients, we're not going to give them any limitations. Mostly, we're going to have them wear a brace for 16 to 18 hours a day. But for those eight hours that they're out of the brace, we actually want them to be doing their sport. So the more they can be physically active and working on their trunk and their core, hopefully doing something fun like a sport instead of just, you know, some exercises, though if exercises are fun to them, that's great too. Uh, but keeping a strong core is going to be important uh, for anyone with a back issue, but even for these adolescents. And, and uh, you know, you kind of alluded to this, but there's been some pretty good studies that have shown that time in the brace seems to help with uh, actual prevention of, of, of prevention of curve progression and, and eventually needing surgery. Uh, but, but it sounds like what your protocol is, is that you have them in the brace for the required amount of time that's going to help them prevent their scoliosis from progressing. But when they're out of the brace, they can do their sport and kind of, you know, remain active in things they like to do. Exactly. We know that you know, up to 16 to 18 hours, there's a great response in the amount that they can avoid a surgery. After that, every hour, there is some incremental improvement and slight better uh, ability to avoid a surgery. But again, we're talking about kind of some small percentage improvements versus a teenager that loves playing sports and is going to be able to keep their core strong and healthy. Uh, so we, that's what we really want them to be doing in those hours out of it. Great. Yeah. So diminishing returns once you get past that 16 to 18 hour mark. Yeah. Versus, you know, quality of life, um, you know, mental wellness. A lot of athletes get that important aspect from their sport. And so we want to encourage that as well. Yeah. yeah. So and the, how, I was going to say, how does ahead. that conversation change, though, once they have a curve that's larger than what can be braced? It seems yeah. as though that conversation really shifts in a different direction. The magic number that we're thinking of, if we think, all right, this curve is one that might be getting too big to be avoiding a surgery and therefore one that might keep getting bigger through the rest of someone's life is about 50 degrees, especially in a growing athlete. And so when we hit that stage, that's really when we start to talk about um, a surgery for them. It's really important that we also address what that looks like for them long term. And again, we want to make sure that they know that once the surgery and the recovery is done, 
uh, we still want that patient to be able to get back to all of the activities that they originally were doing. Now, of course, if we're fusing a, a spine, meaning we're putting in some screws and some rods to make each one of those blocks into one solid bone, their flexibility is gonna be affected by it. So some sports like gymnastics, uh, maybe swimming in some way, they'll see some limitations in the uh, what activities they're physically capable of doing, depending on where it is that their curve is and where we operate. Um, but for the most part, we're gonna allow them to go back to what they wanna do without restrictions from us. And there's a lot of studies looking at when they should go back and how safe is it to go back. And um, uh, there's actually no final word on that. And so it's, it's left up to a lot of the surgeon's discretion and the patient's discretion and uh, working with especially an athlete to get them back to where they want to be. And, you know, for, for me and, and Dr. Louie, who live primarily in the adult world, treating uh, you know, patients with adult scoliosis and other degenerative conditions, we often worry about their ability to heal these fusions, you know, and so we often set restrictions on them postoperatively to give them enough time to heal what do you generally tell your pediatric um, athletes, you know, who have scoliosis surgery in terms of how much time they need to take off entirely from sport and when can they begin the rehab process in terms of starting sport specific activity and training? It's definitely going to be a little bit patient specific and again, surgeon specific. So for me, what I tell the patient is for that first month, we really are careful with them doing a lot of bending and lifting and twisting, but I'll start coaching an athlete through depending on which uh, which sport they are, um, some simple body mechanic things. Uh, you know, you could not bend, lift, or twist and do a squat or a calf uh, raise um, as, just with body weights or walking up inclines. That would all be okay. Uh, at three months is usually when I clear for all aerobic activities. Mm -hmm. So running, biking, starting to get all of your aerobic activities back. This is where there's a difference between different surgeons. And the most recent studies uh, have shown that actually probably we can let people get back to their sports a little bit sooner. Uh, there was a, a couple studies, even just this past year, where at six weeks, the surgeon said, go ahead, do whatever you want. Oh, and wow. just, just let the kids self-regulate themselves. And the return back to sport varied anywhere from that day uh, to 11 months, uh, depending on what the sport was and, and what the teenage athlete wanted to do and how ready they felt. Um, so I'll give you an example. So, so I guess also to mention some really major collision sports, I think in general, I'll maybe hold them till six months, but that's like tackle football, something major. Uh, an example of a patient I had uh, recently was a women's lacrosse player, um, very active, high level, college level, and this is about to be her senior uh, spring season. So this is her last planned uh, you know, season that she thinks she's gonna participate in. And so we're really working closely to try to get her back full speed at four months. Um, so, and it's a collision sport for sure. Uh, so we're just getting her into some therapy earlier, making sure we don't lose her uh, conditioning as, as she goes along and works towards the point where she can really do um, collisions, but getting her to do some stick skills. So it's, it's kind of sport specific and working with how motivated that, that person is and that athlete is, you know, we can tell them either way, it goes either way, right? We can, and you see this in your adults. I can tell them at three months, you can start running. There are people who won't run till six months and there are people who will have already been running for months. Um, so I think a lot of it sometimes, right. We've discussed this together. I know Sometimes we're giving these restrictions because we're the nervous ones, uh, and especially in these young athletes who we're not so worried about them fusing because they're so healthy and robust. We're more worried about them doing too much that sometimes we probably create some some artificial um, uh, limitations that that make us feel better um, in the long run. And yeah, we're only as good as our last complication, right? So right, and, exactly. and, and so studies have shown that. <laughs> So uh, if they ask patients or surgeons, all right, when do you let your patients go back? And then have you ever had a complication of letting a patient go back where you thought was too soon and they had a problem? It really, really affected when uh, these surgeons let them go back. So uh, maybe in 10 years, I'll have a different answer, but I, I, I'm moving earlier and earlier uh, in my practice. Yeah, I think the I, th I think the one thing that really is is dramatic is that 
you know, if you look back uh, 30, 40 years of how people were treated uh, for scoliosis back then, you know, we did not have the advanced instrumentation that we have now, which essentially serves as an internal brace uh, that, that kind of secures the area of fusion much more strongly and, and hopefully allows the, the, you know, for higher fusion rates and earlier return to mobilization. Uh, you know, back, back in the day, people used to be immobilized for six months on bed rest and a body cast, right? You know, and so it's the ultimate lack of activity. And so I think that the, the beautiful thing is the progression of um, uh, how we treat scoliosis, both in the pediatric and adult world, which allows people to get back to their sport and the things they like to do faster and quicker. That raises a great point, right? We're talking about fusion and safety with putting in our screws and our rods and making sure the spine doesn't injure itself. But we're also balancing that with uh, physiology and um, you know how prepared a, a, a patient or a, an adolescent athlete is for strength and cardiovascular fitness. And so if we lose all of that in the time that we're protecting our fusion, then it's also going to be a longer time to get back to, to their sport. And, and I think that's what makes your field so exciting is you're always trying to find this balance between, hey, let's maintain the stability that we've created, but we need you to maintain the strength and, and it, the physiology of being able to return back to what you were doing. And maybe that's why you had the surgery. So I don't know, Dr. Bauer, thank you so much for joining us today. I think that this is a wonderful conversation to have because unlike our population, Dr. Namani, there's parents that are often involved as well. And it's not just the patients who are often kids or preteens who need to hear this, but the parents themselves, because indirectly they need to be treated for, for having to go through this process as well. And, and we certainly are not forgetting about them. So um, thank you so much for joining us. Um, don't forget to follow us on Instagram at The Athletes Fine. Um, take care and we'll, we'll see you all later. Thanks so much, guys. Thanks, Thanks again, Dr. Fryer. Take care.